uh, I'd like to thank you for participating with the Space Walk of Fame's Oral History Project. And if you could state uh, your name, and then we'll start talking about your experiences at Huntsville. Okay, my name is uh, Ike Regal, Titusville, Florida. Okay, now we had been talking a little bit about uh, your experiences with the early years of the space program, and I would like uh, for you to tell me a little bit about uh, your involvement at Huntsville, your arrival, um, your first vision of, of Dr. Von Braun, and so, some of the things that uh, you worked on while in Huntsville. Okay. <coughs> Well, in 1951, I, I was working with uh, TVA up in uh, Tennessee, and and there were a number of young engineers in the training program I was in, and we heard about the uh, rocket uh, program uh, that was being uh, formed in uh, Huntsville, Alabama. So uh, we took off one day to go down and look into that. It sounded fascinating, interesting. And so we went down for an interview, and uh, we were, uh, actually we were offered, all offered a job that day. In fact, we had our choice of several different areas to work in, like the test lab or, or some of the design units or the uh, firing team that would later take this rocket down to Florida. And so that's the one, uh, that's the area that I uh, selected. And, uh, while we were there that day, uh, we were having lunch uh, down in the cafeteria, and uh, I had never seen Von Braun, and I don't recall seeing a picture of him, but I'd heard of him. But a guy came into the door. I was sitting where I was facing the door of the cafeteria, and a guy came in, had this trench coat type coat on. The weather was a little uh, cool that day. And two or three guys with him, and and it clicked with me. That's that's Von Braun. He had the charisma, that uh, I guess you call it leadership or what. But uh, it turned out I was right, and, and that was my first. Uh, I didn't meet him that day, but uh, I did. Uh, from then on, knew who Von Braun was, and <clears throat> so from uh, that day. Uh, you know, I took a job with NASA. It took two or three weeks to close out my, where I was working with TVA, and came back and and uh, joined the uh, missile firing team, which uh, was headed by Dr. Kurt Devis, and his right-hand man was Dr. Hans Gruner, which he was the guy I personally worked for, and <clears throat> so we were assigned to work with our counterparts. I was in the electrical networks area, and so I was assigned to work with uh, my counterparts in the design area that were designing the electrical uh, systems for the uh, Redstone rocket. And one of the guys that uh, my uh, counterpart in the missile design area was uh, Dick Smith, which was later, uh, uh, Dick and I, were been friends ever since, and he was later a uh, center director down here at Kennedy Space Center. And <laughs> so we would, uh, we were assigned to follow the first redstone that was, that was developed, uh, it was developed in Huntsville, designed there by the guys and using a rocket dying uh, engine. And uh, the process was to put this rocket on a static test stand there in Huntsville, fire the engines, make sure it's okay, and then send it through a pre-shipment checkout over in their quality uh, lab. Those guys were in charge of giving it a thorough checkout before shipping it to Florida. So I worked with those guys, in fact our whole team did, and then when the rocket was uh, checked out and ready to go, they would <laughs> load it on the uh, rail cars and ship it to Florida and we would go uh, by uh, you know a private car which usually you you were carrying a lot of the spare parts and maybe even some of the components uh, all the uh, rocket to be installed in Florida because all every trip I made as I recall I had a trunk full of <laughs> rocket parts which I guess you couldn't do today in fact, some of those early uh, components 
and the redstone were actually out of the V2 program. Some of the accelerometers and some of the relays and gyros were actually uh, V2 components and I think one of the, some of the inverters in the early redstones. So we would come to Florida and we set up uh, in a little bunker blockhouse over on the Cape uh, side which was shared by the Bomark program, an Air Force uh, uh, missile program. And uh, we would have our turn set up our consoles, which there weren't many, and connect our cables to the rocket and uh, check it out and launch it. And uh, then clear the blockhouse and go back to Huntsville and pick up the next one. In the meantime, the Bomark people would come in behind us and have their turn at launching. And uh, the first Redstone we launched in August 1953. And the rocket uh, took off in normal fashion and flew down range uh, a few miles and uh, then it went out of control and we lost it. And uh, when we looked over the telemetry records, uh, we found that the uh, the vanes, the control mechanism was off of the, the zero. And the redstone had a, had carbon vanes in the exhaust for the, uh, the engine. It didn't have a pivot. You didn't pivot the engine like you do on the modern rockets, but you control it by deflecting the uh, vane deflection. And as long as it was in a sensible atmosphere, you had vanes just like an aileron on a plane and then uh, carbon vanes in the exhaust of the engine. And uh, so they were off zero, and one of the uh, head guys of the uh, network system in Huntsville, a guy named Hans Fichtner, uh, came up and said that he thought he knew the cause of the failure that uh, and on the last checkout, in, in those days, we were launching it, we the firing team, but we had the, our design guys right with us and they were doing things around the rocket too. So uh, Hans was uh, out there looked, last minute look over the rocket before they closed the doors of the instrument unit. And he said he uh, was tightening up a lock nut on one of the potentiometers that actually controlled the vanes and he thinks that in tightening that lock nut, he inadvertently, and not aware of it at the time, off-centered this potentiometer. And he was convinced, now, here's a guy that was coming up and saying, I did it. And uh, Von Braun took that as a, as a way to go, you know, and uh, commended him for coming up, because it takes a lot of courage to do what I'm saying. He could have quietly uh, never, you know, admitted I was ever out there. Don't you know? And no one would have ever uh, suspected that. So he was not condemned. He was praised. But and the message, and that message lasted throughout. I think uh, made an impression on all of us throughout our career out there. Uh, you can make a mistake, and if you come up and admit it, that's okay. Just don't do it again. <laughs> don't do it the second time. And uh, so that that lesson, and uh, and Hans was you know respected for that, and didn't hurt his, in fact maybe enhanced it, but I always respected him tremendously for that. So uh, uh, I'm getting back to we would launch we would go back to Huntsville. I wonder if you could um, before we move on a little bit and lose the moment if you could describe what the Cape was like when you first got here? Okay, the, uh, when we first came to Florida, our little team of, uh, I don't know, 50 or 60 people, uh, we, there was not many uh, available places on the uh, Cocoa Beach or Cocoa, and, and uh, I live in Titusville now, but I hardly heard of Titusville because this bridge was, the NASA Causeway was not built at that time. And we would uh, stay at these little mom and pop hotels in, uh, on Cocoa Beach or uh, a couple of them in uh, Cocoa. And 
the mosquitoes was unbelievable. I'm talking about big mosquitoes, many mosquitoes. And uh, so we, we always had to, to fight the mosquitoes. And uh, we worked long hours and uh, the, uh, there's not the cafeteria like you have out there today, but we had uh, Hortense in Maryland and they, uh, they ran the roach coach, we call it. There was a little mobile uh, lunch wagon <laughs> and uh, Hortense uh, and Marilyn was, uh, you know, loved by all of us and oh, Marilyn, uh, uh, she was a black woman, very, I know, you know, we all loved her and, and Hortense, uh, she could make a sailor blush with her language. <laughs> And uh, we would always wait for the roach coach to come around, you know, during the uh, night hours and get coffee, hot dogs, whatever else uh, they wanted to make available. And uh, <clears throat> I'd point out again that the, this area here was just coming into to life, if you want to say it like that. There were the contractors were beginning to send people in here from California and, and uh, Martin from uh, up in uh, Baltimore, up in that area. And, and the work population was young. It was young people. Because you didn't, in those days, you didn't go out and hire a guy with 20 years of rocket engine experience because they didn't exist. Or uh, experience, guidance, and control person. And uh, all of the uh, workers were essentially white males. I mean, that's just the way the way it was then. No women, no minorities, very few. And uh, we uh, we all the the working hours were long, and uh, you never knew when you come in what time you'd get off that night. In fact, uh, I've been out there many nights all night. But I think we all loved our job. In fact, I've said many times back then that if I had to, I'd pay to work there. If I, I mean, it was, it, if you love something, it's really not work, you know? If you love to do it, it's not work, it's, it's fun, even though it was uh, full of problems. And, and But we, uh, in 1955, the frequency of the launches were increasing and the decision was made to uh, transfer permanently the, the guys on the launch team under Dr. Davis to Florida. Still everything's on the uh, Cape side, nothing. Merritt Island is not even on the radar scope at that time. And so I moved down with uh, with the other guys. I think we had one or two females in the working then. Uh, Billy Fitzgerald, which is a local real estate dealer, she was Dr. Davis' secretary, and that was about it as far as overhead. <laughs> and uh, so I moved uh, on Cocoa Beach, and I lived there a couple of years. There was about four of us lived in the uh, I mentioned housing was a problem then, and they, they made arrangements for about four of us to live in the on Patrick Air Force Base in the officers' housing quarters there. It was called North Wherry, and Dr. Davis and Dr. Groner and a guy, R.P. Dodd and myself, lived in that uh, uh, complex uh, on the military base <laughs> there for a couple of years, and, and uh, later, uh, I moved to Titusville and I've lived here ever since. But the uh, we developed the uh, Redstone and, and got it to the point that it could be transferred to the military. And of course, the intent then with the Cold War was just getting it was in getting colder and colder. And we were developing the Redstone to take an atomic uh, warhead, which. Uh, was developed by the Sandia Corporation. And later, uh, part of our team uh, was, we were uh, selected a group of, to go out to the Inuitok Islands and fire a couple of redstones with an atomic uh, 
warhead, which was the first and was not publicized at, at that time because it was top secret stuff. Uh, but uh, Dr. Gruner went out there and I stayed here and because we had other launches going here so we had to split our crew. But that was our first, uh, America's first uh, experience with uh, actually you know, detonating a, a missile uh, warhead and they were two successful flights out at the uh, in the Weetalk Islands. How did that play into the development of, of the Redstone, the overall feeling? Was it, were, the, were you and, and your fellow workers more um, concerned with the development of this technological machine or what its capabilities would be? in relation to the Cold War. How, how well, much did the Cold War play into everything? Well, it, uh, it was, that was essentially it, you know. We, we could, I guess, think of future space, but it wasn't, we could, I don't think, I, I know I couldn't think of anything like the Saturn V in, in my short, uh, they would come so, so quickly. So we were really concerned with perfecting this Redstone rocket so it could be deployed over in Europe as a deterrent to the Russians. And uh, we had it, uh, you know, we got it to the point that uh, the Army sent their military guys down and we would launch, uh, uh, they would launch it under our supervision, which later we did the same thing with the Jupiter rocket. We had the, uh, uh, which we deployed in Turkey and Italy, the, uh, their troops would come over and study uh, go to school on the Jupiter rocket up in Huntsville and later come down here under our supervision and launch it. So uh, I'd say our concern was to develop uh, the military aspects of this thing because uh, we were, you know, the Cold War, the Russian, the, the Russian Empire was really uh, uh, a real threat because you can remember it in the missile, uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, a few years later, uh, that's the closest, as far as I know, our country ever came to, or the world, to having a nuclear holocaust. And again, as uh, part of that deterrent, I think, was the, uh, the rockets that we had, uh, Jupiter and the Thor, and the Redstone, and the Persians that we had deployed over in Europe. You've uh, brought up a, a few of the Air Force missiles. Um, I wonder if, if, since you're working for the uh, Army Ballistic Missile Agency, um, if you could describe a little bit about maybe some of the inter-service uh, rivalry. Well, <laughs> uh, uh, let me let me go back a, a little bit and 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 touch on the, uh, if I could, on the uh, Explorer One. Okay. Uh, you know, the International Geophysical Year, which was 1958, as I recall, you know, they wanted to explore space. Yeah. So uh, we, we, the Army Ballistic Missile Agency, which we were at that time, uh, our design folks in Marshall Space Flight Center uh, were convinced that we could launch a, a satellite, you know, the uh, Jet Propulsion Lab uh, had the uh, satellite, we had the rocket. And uh, the decision was made at the higher levels of government uh, that not to do that. And as I understand, uh, we were a military and they that wanted to do it from the civilian aspect. And of course, I, I could never understand that since the Russians, uh, the Sputnik was, uh, and all their rockets were by military uh, rockets. In fact, the low point and one of the low points in my life is is the embarrassment I felt for me and the whole country when the Sputnik was up there beeping and we were down here on the ground and we could have been up there first, not with the size they had capability that we didn't have as far as payload capability, I mean, uh, weight. And so it was decided to uh, go with the uh, civilian aspect of the and on the Vanguard program. And of course that turned out to be a disaster. I hope none of my Vanguard friends are listening. 
but that was, <laughs> that was a greater embarrassment when that went up. So, and then later we got the green light to uh, launch the uh, the first uh, the Explorer satellite, and uh, then when they gave Von Brown that uh, green light to go, you know, it sort of put us on the spot because you know you guys said you could do it now now do it, and we did it. Although I'll, I'll tell you, we were it was really some white knuckle times there. You know, as you're sweating that thing out, and when I remember the night we launched that and as they were picking it up at the tracking stations around the world. It was a, I never had such a great feeling as when they'd pick up the beep of our satellite and confirm that it was in orbit. And uh, so now, so that was the first rivalry, I guess, that I can think of. But then the next is when the uh, Army and the Air Force uh, we're having a tug of war on who was going to be uh, responsible or have the charter to develop the uh, the ongoing rockets. And the Army would say, you know, the, uh, a missile is just uh, like artillery. It's just long range. You, you land, it, launch it from the ground and it lands over there and that's, that's just going to be our future artillery. And the Air Force says, no, that's uh, more more like a bomber. So rather than a bomb, <coughs> delivering bombs like that, we'll deliver, the airplane will deliver them with a rocket. And uh, so that was d debated all throughout, I guess the lobbyists on both sides, and, and then the Navy was sort of getting in there on the side a little bit. But anyway, the, uh, the decision was made to go with the uh, Thor, which is Air Force, which is today's uh, Delta and, and a very good rocket. And uh, maybe, I guess it was the right decision. The Jupiter, we continued to launch some with uh, space probes and were very successful. We, uh, we launched a number of interest in uh, satellites that uh, you know, advanced our knowledge in space. And then later, uh, we got the uh, go ahead for the Saturn 1B, which was a, a, a big step forward from the uh, Jupiter. We, we'd progressed from the uh, Redstone to the Jupiter C uh, uh, to the, which was a, a version of the Redstone to the Jupiter, and then on to the uh, Saturn 1B. And by the way, in the early days, we, we were too responsible with Martin Marietta for developing the Persian rockets. We launched the first Persian rockets from Blockhouse 30 uh, over uh, on the Cape, which uh, you know was later deployed in uh, Russia. A very good, very good system. And, and so uh, Saturn 1B, you know, and uh, uh, later we launched the uh, the Skylab, which was a tremendous piece of equipment. Uh, that Skylab. And it's unfortunately that it finally, you know, we couldn't boost it up. There were some plans in the, at the times, but I guess NASA never could work it money-wise or whatever to, to send a, a machine up that would increase its orbit so it could last. But it was a tremendous uh, laboratory. And of course, out of that 1B2, we uh, did in 1975, we uh, launched the Apollo Soyuz, which was the, you know, with uh, Slayton and his crew that uh, docked with the Russians. And again, that was uh, quite a feat, you know, they think nothing today of Russians and intermingling with the space lab, and that's good, but that was, uh, that was quite a step forward because that was again in the midst of the Cold War when we were uh, able to exchange uh, technical data and, and uh, operational data to get the uh, launch in. And that was a, that was a pretty interesting uh, uh, program because as I recall that, we launched that in mid-July in the afternoon and the Russians, were, the plan, they launched first. So they were up there waiting for us. 
and it would have been terribly embarrassing if we if we had missed that and it was a big concern in that uh, time of the year and time of the day was uh, lightning and we had done quite a bit of lightning study in fact I guess that started it today. Uh, Kennedy probably has most of the lightning experts in the world, I guess. I, uh, I know we were headed in that direction. But uh, they had a big conference at Kennedy Space Center with all the lightning experts. What do you do? Can you discharge the clouds? Or what kind of protection can you do? And, and out of that, some of the protection systems we have out here today uh, with the uh, lightning uh, those early days when we were uh, trying to make sure that lightning wasn't going to keep us from our rendezvous with, with the Russians. And <clears throat> so from the uh, Saturn 1B, and of course the uh, low point in that whole program was when we, 1967, when we had that uh, terrible tra uh, tragedy of the fire in uh, when we lost uh, the three astronauts. Where were you uh, when that occurred? I was uh, I was in uh, Huntington Beach, uh, California. We were uh, we were doing uh, some of the uh, uh, design conferences with the contractors to uh, for the uh, Saturn V. And so I was out there because what we were doing was running a plugs out test, which was really a routine test. And uh, so I was with several others was out there on a design review uh, session on the uh, uh, Saturn, uh, uh, on the four of the, uh, the uh, McDonnell Douglas uh, stage. And uh, I got a call from, uh, uh, Frank Bryan, one of the guys that worked right with me, and he was in the blockhouse. And uh, <clears throat> he, he couldn't tell me. He, he said, <laughs> we just had a bad problem here. I can't say any more. And he had to hang up. I don't even know how he got out. But uh, <clears throat> so I had to wait till uh, the next morning, really, to find out. All I knew then was they had had a terrible uh, strategy. I didn't know that we lost, but I could detect from his voice that it was bad. And of course, uh, at that time with no data, everyone thinks of his, did, did anything that we do in our system cause this? I mean, you know, you have to go through that, that process. And uh, it was, uh, it was just a, very sad day for us, but uh, you know we, we came back from it. And of course, the changes that came out of that, both hardware and procedural, uh, of course, uh, no question, made it uh, enhanced our ability to, you know, successfully go on to to the moon. We're coming up on the uh, half hour. Okay. Yeah, when we uh, left off, we had been discussing uh, uh, mistakes that were learned from the Apollo 1 fire and how that was adapted to the success of, of the Apollo lunar landings. If we could go back now a little bit more back into the mid-50s when we're having a, a, a rate of, of failure, so to speak, uh, that's you know, uh, quite great. Um, if you could discuss uh, the value of, of these failures yes. and, and maybe even recount one or two that are most memorable for you. Hey, uh, well, in, in our early days of uh, rocket business, I'd, I'd say in the 50s, uh, it was not uncommon to have failures. In fact, uh, if you read the uh, report on most flights, uh, it was uh, even it was, uh, we tried to get everything we could out of a partial success. We didn't try to make it sound as, <laughs> as good as we could, but uh, the, the failures, uh, turned out that we learned much more from the uh, failures than we did a good flight. When we had a good flight, uh, uh, you could look back through the records and, and see some areas that uh, 
Yeah, it was a good flight, but it was very close. We we were very close to having a, a serious problem. And of course, you direct your attention on that area, but the, some of the failures that we had were uh, uh, was where we learned the most. Uh, I, I recall one failure we had on uh, uh, Jupiter 16, which was a satellite probe, and and it was gonna, it was aimed to be a documentary because Edward R. Murrow had uh, gotten with uh, NASA and he was gonna do a documentary from the time you receive a rocket until it's launched. So his uh, Femin crew was with us every day. And uh, then the moment of, uh, you know, the big moment was left off. And so we pushed the button and the rocket went up a few feet and went over and landed a few hundred yards which was a very, very embarrassing because all that was on TV. And, uh, uh, but the, the thing we learned on that, uh, we learned immediately, we had a problem with an inverter. That's a little machine that turns the um, DC voltage into 400 cycle uh, AC voltage to run the gyros and accelerometers. And we had a short uh, in that, and we, we recovered it and found that the clearance on uh, uh, a couple of electrical points in there was not sufficient. And during the lift off phase, the uh, vibration brought those together, shorted the thing out, and, and you have no control system. So we learned a good lesson from that about uh, vibration testing and the clearance and to, and to look at, uh, you know, components, not only that inverter, but other components as far as the uh, being built and make, and as far as the vibration levels that uh, they go through. So we learned some, some good lessons. Another uh, a lesson uh, we learned on one of the redstones, it took off and went horizontal and range had to blow it up was uh, loose fit in on one of the pressure lines and it came loose and it was just like a jet, uh, just like a little engine that uh, put it into a roll condition that, uh, you know, caused it to go out of control. So all the, uh, all, all the failures were, uh, you know, we capitalized on that to make sure that we didn't experience the same failure and I don't recall that we had the, you know, that we had the same failure twice. I mean, we, the equipment then was not as uh, reliable as today. You know, you, your uh, home computer can just run on and on without a, a problem. But then you had uh, uh, relay, step and switch, and, uh, and components that were much more susceptible to failure than the... Uh, electronic hardware today. And then the uh, envir uh, environment it has to go through is uh, vibration and and uh, then keeping it out here on the launch pad for several weeks maybe uh, in the solid atmosphere, that's another thing you fight. Does that present a, a very challenging problem? Yes. And uh, especially on some of the equipment on the uh, ground uh, sport equipment, it has to be out there uh, day after day. So that was always a, a challenge. If you could, uh, we were talking a little bit earlier and, and you were saying about the telemetry data, that whether it was a success or, or a failure, you always poured over the data. Yeah, um, okay. after each launch, uh, before we, we would go home, we would get all that telemetry data that was available and we had a a data evaluation room where we would, and, and the, the data then was, it would come out on uh, strip charts, it, you know, if you're just a long roller, like a paper towel type size and just put it on a, on a vertical board like a blackboard, just tape it, pin it up there. And then all the system guys would have to go through as, as soon as this uh, came out of the, uh, telemetry guys, and uh, they would go pour over each, uh, each line and each wiggle, and uh, you know, they would sign off, yes, I have looked at this re uh, record, and identify any questions or, or problems. 
And uh, the point I'd make is, even though to the outside world, that was a perfect flight. That's a whole hum. Uh, God, not anything to it. You know, just push the button and there it goes. But you can go back and look at the records and you can find uh, something on that, uh, this wiggle or, or, or that, that that meant you were very close to a disaster and that uh, you better do something to that or you will have a disaster. The potential is there. And likewise, you can go with the data on a rocket that's been a disaster in flight and you could uh, say, well, by golly, you know, we almost got there. A few seconds more and we wouldn't have had. So the, the point I make is between success and failure, sometimes the margin is not very much. In fact, I suspect on every flight the guys could go through and find something that needs their attention or, or later on we are going to have a, have a problem. So we, we placed a lot of emphasis on looking at the data. I know on the, uh, Saturn V, it was the third or fourth launch uh, that going through the records, uh, we found that uh, the ground equipment was, during the liftoff sequence in the process of disconnecting the cables, <clears throat> the ground equipment was trying to uh, send a signal to cut the engines off through a sneak circuit arrangement. In other words, one pin in a cable disconnecting relative to another and you lose a solid ground connection, then you can have uh, circuits that wander all through the system and some you don't want. And uh, so we had to go in and put a, a fix on that or sooner or later in that program, we would, that, the tolerance buildup would have been sufficient to cut the engines off during a liftoff. Now we experienced something like that on uh, uh, back on the Jupiter C program when we were launching an early version of the uh, of the uh, spacecraft when they escaped tower, and so we had tried to you know fix that to put a permanent ground strap or a ground strap that would be for sure the last thing disconnected in uh, the liftoff sequence. But even with that, we had a situation on Apollo where we came close to having a sneak circuit cut the rocket engine. And of course, if they'd cut the engines off, the Saturn V would have collapsed right on the pad. Rocket would have been gone and Complex 39A would have been like the uh, Twin Towers. So, uh, you know, we, we, again, we placed a lot of emphasis on knowing, even in the success, how close we were, what our margins were, and uh, if we had any areas of weakness that we tried to beef that up. If we could uh, go back to uh, uh, the mid-50s a, a little bit, we've, um, we discussed the, the, the age of the workers was very young, and that led to an atmosphere um, in regard to their views on failure. Yeah, well, in the in the early days when we started in the rocket business, I'd say the workforce in Brevard County, I'm talking about related to the missile works, was I'd say in the high 20s because we came down here, uh, we were new in the rocket business uh, because then you you didn't go out and hire an experienced rocket man or an experienced goddess control guy because they didn't exist. And when you're young like that, uh, you know, you have a lot of uh, enthusiasm, you have a lot of uh, uh, desire to go and you're, you're not as afraid as a failure as you are as you grow older, as I, as my experience, and I think that's typical. Uh, <clears throat> again, it's like a a little kid when he's learning how to walk with a room full of people. He can fall down and tumble and do all kind of funny spells, and it doesn't bother him. He gets up and tries again. He's not embarrassed, 
and this, I think you can translate that into uh, the workforce. When you're young, we had failures, but we uh, we weren't afraid to try again. Uh, Redstone three, the uh, third Redstone, it went up a few inches and collapsed on the pad. Well, we didn't have a feeling, oh golly, we're going to give up and you can't do this. We we were anxious. We couldn't wait till we got the next rocket down to prove <laughs> that that uh, you know we can do it. And because as you grow older, and I've observed this, and I think it's true for people, it's true for organizations, that as you grow older, you get a little more sensitive to uh, how am I going to look on this if it fails? Uh, I'm not sure I'd look too good. So I, b I believe we need a committee to make this decision. What you're really thinking is if I if this fails, then they can't blame me. They've got a whole committee is uh, at fault here. And uh, and that's the way you you evolve. And the same way with organizations, you get more and more. As you, as you grow older, you accumulate regulations, and you never get rid of any of them like the government. You know, you keep adding add to it. And uh, like in, in the early days of... Uh, of the rocket business in the uh, Redstone and and somewhat in the Jupiter, uh, we had very few procedures. Our countdown procedure was probably a couple of pages, and we really didn't pay any attention to that. Every guy, like the uh, guy responsible for the stabilized platform or the propellant system, all the guys on the consoles, they were responsible for that system and they knew it. And uh, they knew that they would be accountable for it. And they, uh, we weren't looking for a piece of paper that he, he signed to say it's okay, we're looking to him. And, and you took uh, responsibility. And uh, later as you uh, get a little more advanced, of course I, I realize you have to get more organized, but then the procedure gets more complex. And because uh, in the, uh, in the early part of the days, too, the uh, responsibility on the uh, uh, firing team was pretty awesome from this respect. Uh, even in the Apollo 5, if you visualize that control room out there with all those rows of consoles, uh, there's meters, there's dials, there's strip chart recorders, there are red lights, green lights, caution lights. And it's all up to the operator of that console to interpret what that means and call a cutoff if, if something is, is not right. Whereas fortunately today, and we were we started back then to try to put as much of that in the computer, you pre-think it and you program it into the computer so the last few minutes you've taken the human real-time decision making process out, and that's good. You, you follow me there? Uh, in other words, uh, after this amount of time, it's all on a computer. If the computer, it, it's either uh, go or no go. But uh, before we had that capability, uh, we had certain consoles and certain guys authorized to call a cutoff. Cutoff means stop the sequence. For the test conductor, that means uh, I've got a situation here that I think is uh, serious enough that we shouldn't continue. Cut off. Now, back early in that, you can discuss it, and and uh, but if you get down into that time frame where you have no uh, opportunity to discuss it with all the right people, you have to call a, a cut off to stop the sequence, and then you go. Uh, off-site, uh, offline, and uh, if you have that opportunity, and, and talk about it. And we we had a concern, uh, you know, for a period there, uh, especially in Apollo 5, where uh, if you had someone that wanted to cause some trouble on the internet, on the net, they could call a cutoff, and you don't know who it's from. Of course, they they give their station call sign. Uh, 
cut off. But we had we had to guard against that and make sure that we didn't have the lines that went out into some of the vast parts of the, the VAB. Because you're talking about cutoff in the last sequence, you know, uh, I mean, the, just in the liftoff time frame, and, and that's something you want to avoid. But uh, you, you got to appreciate these guys that are on a console looking at a strip chart or looking at a, whatever indications they have, and they are, they have to make that decision. And the more, and uh, and and that's when you've got to really, you know, put your trust in in the right guy to do that. And the more you can get it into the computer and as far up as you can get it, uh, then that's that's good. We've we've discussed a number of major milestones in in, in, in the space program or the history of space. Um, the first uh, with Sputnik and reflections on Sputnik and, and Explorer One. Um, we discussed a little bit about Apollo. If we could move back um, to the the Redstone with the Project Mercury yeah. a little bit, and if you could describe uh, um, maybe um, your your reflections at the, at the launch of Alan Shepard and the build up to Alan Shepard. Well, uh, well, the build up to it was uh, of course la uh, launching the the monkeys. The primates. That was that put a little interesting aspect on our operations out there. And then when we were told that we were going to get the Redstone man rated, that means you know it was designed as a military <coughs> vehicle, whereas the uh, like the Apollo uh, Saturn V was designed from day one to launch astronauts. So you had to go through all the you know the process and see what you need to do to enhance the reliability um, to make it man rated because in the military uh, you can afford more so to if you got a target you can launch 10 and uh, you'd be satisfied maybe if nine or eight or whatever hits the target or in that area but in the man you don't want you know you want 10 for 10 you you follow me there i mean there's no room for and 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 you, and you uh it comes into your mind that everything i do to this you know you you got a mental picture of the astronaut and his life is depends on you doing your job right and we all uh we all wanted that challenge and we relished it but yet with it came uh a sense of responsibility that uh, you got to make sure that uh, you're doing you're doing this thing right. So we would pour over everything, and especially like in our tests, we'd pour over the data. We would inspect. We would look. We we just did everything humanly possible that we knew how to do to make sure that our systems were going to perform as they were designed during that, uh, for that launch. And of course, with a guy up there, uh, it, it gives you, you know, you have to sweat out the countdown. I mean, you're, uh, maybe you've launched a lot of rockets, but that, that puts a new dimension on it. And uh, when you, you, you're following that thing and you, you just, a sense of relief when, you know, that you know your rocket has performed and the astronauts safely uh, separated and, and on the way down. And of course that was just the forerunner with the Saturn 1B uh, and then the Saturn 5, but every time, I, and I think it always will be, when you have the crew aboard, it's gonna give you a, a special sense of responsibility. Shortly after uh, Alan Shepard's launch, we have uh, Kennedy, uh, 20 days after Alan Shepard's 15-minute launch, we have Kennedy giving his uh, lunar pledge to land a man on the moon by the end of the decade. Um, for you personally, uh, when you heard that, what did you think? Well, I'm not sure I recall exactly what I was thinking, but I, I can 
tell you that uh, we were all so elated, it's hard to say, but uh, to visualize, you know, the VAB, the Saturn V, and Launch Complex 39, I still couldn't uh, grasp all that. And uh, I remember, uh, uh, you know, we, we were still launching uh, rockets, uh, the Saturn 1B, but we were still, you know, a lot of our time was devoted to how is this thing going to look like? What is the, uh, uh, we got to learn the, the uh, flight systems. We got to integrate that with the ground. So we spent a lot of time in Huntsville talking with the guys up there how the panel layouts. You, you have a meter here, you have a switch here. So the human engineering aspects of it. And we made many trips out to California to uh, meet with the design guys out there on uh, the uh, Saturn, uh, you, you know, the uh, S2 and, and down in the shoe, the S1C. And I remember the first trip to Huntsville when they had a mock-up of the Saturn V. And I couldn't believe it. I mean, I thought, you can't launch something this, this big. I mean, it's just because you, you relate that to the uh, first of the Redstone and then the Jupiter and the, uh, and the Saturn uh, 1B, but yet this thing is so huge that your mind, it's hard to comprehend that. And then, you know, then they begin to develop models of the, and the, uh, and the service structure, and, and uh, it was all a team effort. What's the service structure going to look like? And uh, what is the, uh, how are you going to get the thing to the pad? How are you going to stack it? How are you going to assemble the stages? How are you going to check them out? What's the, uh, what's your control system from the control room to the uh, complex? And how do you assemble, a, train the team? And it was such a huge undertaking. But I think, uh, again, we were, and uh, we, we just, we just relished it. I mean, day after day, you'd come in, there'd be problems, insurmountable, it seems, but uh, we, had, we had excellent leadership. I mean, uh, I go back again to give Rocco Patron, because Rocco had the, the challenge to get that complex, uh, the VAB, which, you know, that, uh, there's nothing like that. I mean, there was nothing like that in the world. And, uh, and then uh, the crawl away out to the, uh, to the pad and uh, how you check it out here and then uh, maintain control of that up, up through launch and, uh, and uh, gather the procedures and then to integrate the firing team to, you know, had to uh, get all the contracts and, and uh, get the makeup of the uh, launch team and we had all the major aerospace contractors, uh, Bowen, uh, Rockwell, McDonnell Douglas, IBM, General Electric, and the spacecraft of course had uh, uh, Grumman and uh, Rockwell. And to integrate all that into uh, a team was, was a challenge and it was, uh, you know, every, every day was a uh, was a new day, I mean, just a new, a new problem. But uh, again, I would say uh, we all were, were so involved in it that uh, I guess I've said before I would pay to work out there. I mean, it was that, because uh, if you're really having fun and like what you're doing, it's not work. And uh, again, I would uh, say the leadership of uh, of the whole uh, space program, uh, you know, from our side we had uh, Dr. Von Braun and uh, Marshall Space Flight Center, and then had uh, Dr. Davis, Dr. Gruner, and uh, from the headquarters uh, George Miller and General Phillips, and of course the spacecraft, uh, Gil Ruth and Chris Kraft. I mean, um, overall it was just a top, and the contractors, you know, had top guys, you know, in, in their organization. So it, it was a, a team. I've been told there was around 400,000 people at one time on that program. And to make all those uh, play together 
And we, we had a tremendous uh, team spirit as far as our uh, NASA contractor. We had no turf. Well, you might have some minor things all along, but uh, but we, we played together. And, and uh, I think I mentioned before, you look in that firing room several hundred people they had to be had to be like one an orchestra that each one uh, is in tune doing his thing uh, in line with what's what's happening over there and to develop the management and the uh, control procedures for that was was an awesome thing um, and I know and of course first he had to buy the land on Merritt Island and uh, then uh, we had uh, we had a a big chart room in uh, in uh, firing room four, which was not implemented then as a firing room. But we had the pert charts where all the things uh, like the swing arms, the VAB, the crawler, the uh, launch pad, and the support buildings, all those things had to fall into place at a certain date to meet the end point, and. Uh, but the the thing is, we had a specific goal, and that's uh, I think that's one problem in many areas today. Your goal is people don't have a specific goal, but our goal was to reach the moon in that decade <laughs> and return. So what we did in uh, 1967 or 68 or or back then actually was aimed at that. Uh, you know uh, that we had a goal, mm -hmm. and and, and I'll, I'll tell you a, a flight that uh, maybe doesn't get the recognition in, in importance as it should. Of course, we focus on uh, Apollo 11, where they landed on the moon. But uh, Apollo 10 with Gorman, with Borman, uh, you know when they went around the moon. Apollo 8. Apollo 8. Yeah, not 10. That was Stafford when they looped. Yeah. Apollo 8. And Christmas of, uh, that was 68, yeah. That flight, because that was the first flight, see, of that uh, man flight of that uh, Saturn V. And to put all that together, and and, uh, and the, the uh, I won't call it the nerve, but the confidence our top guys had in giving us a go, uh, go ahead to do that, it was awesome, because you, you have to think of what those guys had to make that decision. Here's a uh, put those three guys on it, and it's never flown as a entire system. And uh, to because that wasn't in the original plans, and to put that in there and, and go do it, it was uh, that, that was an awesome task. And because uh, we we had had problems. Uh, Prior to that, we had a vehicle we called a 500F. It was a facility checkout vehicle, you know, not to fly. It was a dummy as far as flight, but to check out the ground equipment, the propellant loading equipment. And uh, we had a lot of difficulty in, uh, you know, in getting <laughs> that operation. And we had a lot of difficulty in the, uh, in the checkout period of the uh, uh, the Apollo, you know, to run a successful uh, countdown demonstration test took days. And some days you'd almost get discouraged. Well, every time I get uh, almost down to zero, a red light comes on. So we go back and fix it. But uh, when the day came to launch on every Apollo, uh, we had two delays, as I recall. One for a piece of ground equipment and Apollo uh, 12, I believe it was, we had some weather problems and delayed. Uh, let's see, that's the one where you know, lightning, you know, hit the hit it after it was, and uh, that was, a, I think, a miracle that we didn't suffer any real damage in that spacecraft from that uh, lightning hit. We've got about one more minute, so okay. you know, we're going to lose tape. Okay. Um, if you could just uh, sum up the legacy, what you feel of, of Project Apollo. Well, <clears throat> I think the Apollo project uh, is really one of the is 
Ms. Armstrong said, uh, you know, one small step for man, one giant step for mankind. I think you could apply that to the to the whole program. <laughs> Pardon? You can keep going. Okay. Um, I think it demonstrates to me what the, human, uh, what the American spirit can do when you really set a goal and are de determined to get there and have the, the right leadership and the team spirit that there's nothing that, that we can't do. And um, for a while I thought in my lifetime we'd lost that. I'm, you know, some recent events I think I'm encouraged that we maybe have not lost all that. that uh, we can do it. And I think only history down the road will uh, tell us what the significance of uh, the uh, Apollo, the uh, landed on the moon. Of course, uh, we expected, uh, I expected in my lifetime before now to see, you know, uh, a Mars program. But uh, of course, uh, we didn't get the funding for that and we had some good hard, uh, space hardware that never did get uh, used uh, due to that. But I think uh, if we had been supported, you know, we could have had men uh, traveling to Mars by this, this time. Mm 